I'm excited to introduce our program and panelists. The rising importance of climate risk to investors and all stakeholders, along with the decreasing availability of capital for traditional hydrocarbon investments, is a top priority for the energy sector. Today, we will discuss the current environment, what to expect going forward in terms of investor expectations and capital availability, as well as the impact on companies across the energy value chain, including their customers and suppliers. And we will hear insights from our panel on how this dynamic should inform board level strategy discussions. Our panelists today represent a broad spectrum of investor perspectives. Marianne Dwight is an experienced attorney who specializes in fund advisory services. She works with asset managers across all asset classes and at every stage of fund development. Previously, Marianne held several high profile roles in the Texas state government, including general counsel to the $65 billion Texas Treasury Safekeeping Trust Company, where she served on the investment committee. Kayla Hand is the head of ESG at Quantum Energy Partners. Quantum focuses on investing across the sustainable energy system. Kayla has held ESG and sustainability leadership positions with top companies, including PepsiCo, NASA, and Crown Holdings. At Quantum, Kayla leads the ESG strategy throughout the investment life cycle. Steve Trauber is the vice chair and global co-head of natural resources and clean energy transition at Citi. Steve has served as a financial advisor on over $600 billion of global energy transactions, including many of the largest and most transformative transactions in the energy space. Steve will kick off the discussion today with an overview of sustainability and investor trends. Following that, Kayla and Marianne will share their perspectives, and we will then open the discussion to your Q&A. Please use the chat box as we go along and I'll pose your questions to the panelists. And with that, I'll turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Kathleen. And uh, thank you uh, to the board for, for having me here. I wanted to spend a few minutes and I apologize up front that uh, while my time was eight to 10 minutes, it's probably gonna run slightly longer, but I'm gonna zip through this. So I apologize to everybody um, for going through it too quickly. I hope it'll serve as a prompt for the uh, 40 to 45 minutes that we'll have available to questions. But I wanted to hit on uh, really sustainability and what we're seeing from an investment trend uh, in the marketplace today. Why don't we go to the first slide here, uh, please? And because it is, it is being talked about at every board meeting. And if it's not, it ought to be. Uh, candidly, most boards are beginning to implement uh, sustainability uh, committees on their board. It's, it's becoming the key topic from an investment perspective. And investors, uh, when companies are going in to meet with investors, it's the first question they want to talk about most of the time. So what are these emerging and accelerating trends, uh, ESG trends? Uh, number one, uh, obviously, sustainability is, is undertaking a revolution. And sustainability means a lot of things to a lot of people. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but there's some very major secular transitions underway. And the market has bought into that in a very large way. Net zero by 2050 is no longer an option. It is, it is table stakes. You must commit to net zero by 2050, or you will become uninvestable and unbankable. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Today, $90 trillion of capital is moving away from high carbon emitting uh, sectors and companies toward lower carbon businesses and those that are committing to improve their carbon and greenhouse emissions and meet certain sustainability challenges that lay in front of us. Uh, the green recovery is underway. Huge stimulus by governments around the world, including our, our own, which is driving government growth policy and regulatory agendas, much of which is targeting the clean, clean agenda and, uh, and sustainability. Greater corporate focus on the S of ESG, social, uh, is going to become very critical. We'll talk a little bit about that and the, and the just transition. We believe uh, also increasingly of importance, biodiversity and nature capital is going to be the next net zero. It is going to be increasingly important for boards to be talking about that ecosystems, land, ocean, sea, maintaining the biodiversity that has been eroding us for quite some time now. And then on top of all of this is a harmonizing ESG reporting standards for uh, rating agencies, outside consultants, uh, your audit firms, we're all trying to establish a standard framework to, so we can measure 
sustainability, so measure net zero, net uh, measure carbon emissions. Uh, definitionally, we need to be aligned and measurement purposes, we need to be aligned. This is all moving toward large uh, sustainable financing innovations, new technologies, and huge investment opportunities. Next page, please. This, these are the system transformations that are underway. The World uh, Benchmarking Alliance has identified seven different uh, tra system transformations that are necessary and that are goals around the 17 uh, uh, goals that have been set out by the United Nations. Uh, they, they contain social, agriculture and food, decarbonization and energy, which is obviously uh, at the forefront of a lot of our minds given uh, we're here in Texas, the circular economy or recycling, uh, which is really the decoupling of con consumption and production, being able to uh, reuse uh, uh, produced items again and again, the digital uh, technologies, uh, greater information, being able to use that information to make better decisions, urban, and a wrapper around all of this is the financial systems. I talked about uh, that a moment ago, $90 trillion, banks, uh, asset managers, all aligning to making sure that they're evaluating companies on these, on these seven transformational systems and what they're doing with regards to improvement in these areas. Next page, please. We've also seen those companies that are embracing the ESG uh, opportunities uh, are outperforming those that are not embracing or are not talking about it as vocally. We've seen over the course of the last two years, almost a 30% differential. When you look within sectors, com companies uh, with competing against other companies within their own sector, what is the outperformance? It's been almost 30%. Likewise, uh, on the cost of their debt, we're seeing cost of debt for companies that are either issuing green bonds or more vocal about their ESG standards, their carbon emissions, et cetera, are having a lower cost of debt uh, as, as well. Next page, please. I mentioned, I mentioned the financial wrapper around this. You know, uh, GFANS, which is a Glasgow financial alliance, which, and, and these numbers are sli slightly dated. So let me, I'm gonna update the numbers. This is now 90 trillion, and this has just happened over the last six months, 90 trillion of assets under management are now signed up under GFANS. And what is GFANS? GFANS is a combination of asset managers, asset owners, banking and insurers. These are the, this is the finan global financial system that is committed to uh, net zero uh, in, in, in uh, scope one, two, and three, which means they cannot invest, we cannot lend to companies that are not working on their net zero and committed to net zero. Uh, on a go forward basis, not starting today, but over time. So we are all working with our uh, clients in order to work with them to get to a net zero by 2050 and a glide path and, and uh, vocalization of that glide path to the market uh, by 2030. So this is critically important. This is $90 trillion over, uh, it's now up to 250 members. The net asset owners are about 70 members. Banks are 53 members. Uh, the asset owners, 128 members very substantial imp importance here as it pertains to companies and their access to capital and ultimately their cost of capital. Next page, please. You can see here uh, the growing acceptance of net zero 50. Uh, you can see in the chart on the right, North America was late to adopt uh, really in, in any significant way. It really started improving mid 2019 and 2020. And you can see the significant ramp of the number of companies that are committing to net zero. Euro, Europe started uh, ahead of the US, but today you can see how many companies uh, are there. Uh, over a thousand companies are, are now committed to net zero. Big, uh, big discussion going on at COP26 in Glasgow in November, pulling together governments, investors, and banks. And out of that, we expect to see significantly more commitments and significant more definition around what global investors and banks and governments are seeking with regards to a cleaner, cleaner environment and around sustainability. Next page, please. Here are the governments that have already committed to 2050 uh, or 2060 who've set, set goals out there. Uh, by pledge, it, it represents over 73% of the carbon emissions on a global basis, over 70% of the GDP on a global basis represents about 40% of the population and 38% of the oil production on a global basis. This will likely increase significantly as a result of COP26, which as I mentioned is in November. 
Next page, please. Here's the 20, here's the 90, uh, 90 billion dollars. I mentioned 128 asset managers, 53 banks, 70 asset owners. These are committed financial institutions who are moving their capital away from high emitters or those companies that are not committing to a plan of net zero by 2050. And uh, so increasingly that's important. Uh, we, you, know, you notice that uh, active investors are equally moving into this and forcing companies. Uh, Exxon came under attack this year by, uh, by an activist by the name of Engine One, forcing them to greater com uh, commitments with regards to net zero, greater commitments with regards to their investment in, in clean energy transition. Next page, please. You can see, as I mentioned, a number of companies under attack by investors and by activists in order to improve upon what they're committing to and what they're doing in terms of investments in clean energy transition. On the, on the left side are those companies that receive significant shareholder proposals in the most recent uh, annual meetings. And, and as a result of those proposals, several companies are making changes and, and making more commitments to what they're gonna do in terms of clean energy transmissions, clean energy transition and, and greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions as well. In terms of also other sort of sustainability ESG related metrics as well. Those on the right actually saw large investors take ownership of, of significant positions in their companies and force uh, changes in the boardroom. Exxon Mobil as a result, as I mentioned, Engine One, had to replace three board members with outside board members who are committed to supporting uh, the activists. Behind Engine One were substantial number of investors, BlackRock, Wellington, T. Rowe, the name brand investors, the large money managers out there supporting Engine One and their mission to get ExxonMobil in that case and in other uh, cases uh, to change their view on what they're doing with regards to ESG and, and energy transition. Next page, please. This just shows a, a number of areas uh, that we're seeing pop up as a result of energy transition themes and, and sustainability themes. You can see that there are trillions of dollars going into this area and expected to go into this area on a, on a go forward basis. Today, I'd, I'd, I'd wager to say it's over a trillion, close to $2 trillion on an annual basis, expected to be five to $6 trillion of capital moving into energy transition and sustainable, uh, sustainability themes by 2025, 2026. Next page, please. What's happening on the investment uh, investor front? Uh, you can see on this page, if you can see it, uh, the gray lines on, on the top are fund flows into passive investments. And the dark blue blinds are fund flows out of active investors. What that means is that uh, passive investing is growing rapidly. Active investing is falling significantly. And in an attempt to to draw more money into the active investors. Those are the Black Rocks, Wellingtons, T. Rose of the world. Uh, they're having to be more active and more vocal as it pertains to certain themes. Those themes are the ESG themes we've talked about here. In order to attract the higher fees that active investors command, they have to become more active. They have to take on the, the thematics of the retail investor. So we're seeing them become much more active. If you look in the top right chart, Act, these are the activists. In 2012, there were a limited number of activists and a number, of, a slow number of growing activists. Today, 53% of the activists that we saw, uh, that we see today are repeat. We have 47% of the number of activist campaigns going on are first time activists. These are the Fidelities and the Newberger Bermans, the Artesian partners, as you can see just below that. These are the activists uh, active investors, not typically historically known as activists, but they are becoming much more vocal and much more active, be it public or, or quietly. Many of these active investors are really doing it quietly behind the scenes, but there are some, as we've seen, like BlackRock and the BlackRock, the BlackRock letters that are going out that are driving ESG investing and driving uh, companies to pay a lot more attention and take action in terms of ESG dynamics. Let's go to the next page, please. And again, this is the chart on the left that shows uh, between 2007 and 2020 uh, that at passive investors have gone from 21% of the total assets under management to 37% and continues to grow uh, in scale. Next page. What is happening in terms of the types of investors? And types of investors are quickly moving toward growth investors and income investors. Uh, it's come at the cost of value investors. Today, growth investors are making up a significant amount of assets under management 
and that growth target has changed dramatically. It used to be four to seven percent represented a growth investor target. Today, that's seven to ten percent. So, uh, if you want to be attracted attractive to growth investors, your company has to have top line growth of seven to ten percent. That is where a lot of the activity is being drawn from today. Second one is is income investors, those that are paying dividends, uh, much more sustainable, high high return generators. But these are the two big areas for for attracting big dollars to the company. To move to move the needle in terms of valuations, you've got to go after the big dollars. The big dollars today are growth and income investors, and, and it's come at the cost since 2010 of, of value investing. Next page. Uh, these are the things activist investors seek. I'm going to uh, I'm going to actually stop here. My time is over, uh, but I, I just wanted to leave this with you. Uh, the only point I would make on this page is that you see ESG toward the bottom. ESG, I think that 9% is going, going to increasingly become a larger and larger percent of what active investors are going to be forcing companies to do. So if it's not a lead topic at the board level today and getting a lot of attention, it needs to because it's going to be causing uh, investors to be questioning what's going on at the company. They will either vote vocally, come in and force change, or they will leave with their feet and they will take their dollars with them. So to maintain strong valuations and investor interest, ESG is gonna to have to become a major focus uh, for all companies on a near-term basis. I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, we don't need to do the last page and turn it over to the next investor. We'll uh, stay open for questions in, in, after we're done. Thank, thank you, Steve. That was could not have been a better setup for our next speaker. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kayla to give us her perspectives on this topic. Thank you, Kathleen, and, and thank you, um, the Tri-Cities chapter, for having me today. Steve, your introduction says it all, so I'll try not to be redundant. And with an effort to, to bring it closer to the implementation, right? So how do we get all that macro and bring it down to how we, we embed ESG in the operations, right? So Quantum Energy Partners is a leading private capital firm that invests across the global energy value. Uh, we we had historically had about 17 billion um, AUM and we are actively investing in both traditional energy and renewables and now more and more so under the umbrella of the energy transition. As active investors, as Steve was saying, we, we look at the SG with an eye toward value creation and risk avoidance. So maybe I'll take, before I go into how we embed ESG throughout our life, our deal life cycle, and maybe I'll talk a little bit about what ESG, what does that entail, right? So value creation and risk avoidance is what we look at when we, we, we take ESG action and we integrate it throughout our deal life cycle, all the way when we're prospecting an opportunity through the time when we exit a, a company from our portfolio. During the deal life cycle, we, we look at all phases and we focus mostly on the ownership phase. So that makes us very similar to what a public company is doing in terms of embedding ESG. And similar to what is done in the public, uh, in a public company, we look at it from pretty much, I'd say three main phases. We look at it from the prioritization of ESG, factors, we look at it from the implant drive in the implementation of ESG in the operations, and then utilizing all the resources and the results of that work that is done to implement ESG on the operations to communicate the performance of that company towards uh, access to capital and value creation at exit. So, I'll, I'll speak just very, very briefly about each one of these phases and then I'll leave towards the end for conversation, right? So we help our companies prioritize ESG factors. And obviously, as Steve just mentioned, there's nothing else on the top, very, very top of the ESG priority list as there is climate, right? So with the scope one being at the center of attention because of methane in the energy industry that is laser focus where we are focusing on for, for uh, GHGs, emissions and, and, and abatement. But then we also look at scope two and scope three with the scope three for the energy industry being the hardest one to deal with 
uh, because we we are we have very little of our emissions that comes from the supply chain, uh, which is different from other sectors, right? And we can talk a little bit more about that later on on the Q&A, uh, but the laser focus right now is methane emissions. And then also there is a rise to attention paid to water. Um, and then again, we look at all this at, from the perspective of value creation or risks, right? So both from the climate side, looking at how all all that there is in terms of emissions, uh, resources scarcity with the case of water can potentially impact the operations value currently or in the future at the time of exit. Similarly, on the, on, under the S pillar, we, we focus very heavily on human capital and that's pretty much everything that has to do with our employees, the communities where we operate. And currently the focus really is on, on safety, diversity, equity, and inclusion mostly, most recently. Um, and then very strong attention on how that drives human capital currently and in the future as well. So attention, uh, capture and retention. And then under the governance pillar, we are very much focused on, I would say there are two things there that are very important that drives pretty much everything else under the ESG program, which is, monitoring, measuring, and improving performance, and, and then working with the leadership to tie their performance with uh, their ESG performance with compensation. Um, and, and that really drives me to the next part of the cycle, the ESG implementation, which really is to drive ESG through operations. So when we work with our companies during the ownership phase, we look, we, we help them prioritize these issues and then we help them embed ESG on their operations, just like they would do with anything else that would drive productivity. Uh, we, we help them establish KPIs, monitor those KPIs, and then drive the, the performance of these KPIs, frequently looking at and checking how they're doing, comparing them with peers, including peers on the public side as well. Um, and then here, I, there, are, there are two things that I, I mentioned that are very important here during this phase of implementation. One is data and the importance of understanding where you are performing, what, what are you measuring, how you're doing compared to, you, to your peers and competition, and how you're engaging with your stakeholders to uh, communicate that performance. Um, currently, there is there is a huge push in the market for, for more data quality. And I think that comes with the various stakeholders, including investors, activists, NGOs, all looking at the variety of data that is available through state and federal agencies, using algorithms to come up with their evaluation of companies through ESG ranking companies. Um, and then come up and evaluate the company themselves externally. So when we guide our companies, we, we ask them, look at what you're doing, look at the data that is generated with that and use that as engagement with your stakeholders to drive that narrative, be the owner, uh, be, we invite them to be enthusiastic and, and authentic about the story that they, they tell, but then be accountable for that data including from bringing in third-party verification of that data, which is one of the main requests that we hear from investors currently. And I think that applies to public companies very well. Um, and then as all of these pertains to access to capital, uh, I think pretty much everything ties up really nicely because in order to be have access to sustainability linked loan or to just plain old fashioned capital as Steve was mentioning, uh, companies will have to show their baseline performance uh, and then set targets a near term and long term. And if you have to start from scratch, um, establishing those KPIs and measuring uh, it's going to take longer for you to have access to that to that um, capital. So we are working with our companies to establish that process from the moment they are entering our portfolio. In fact, when we do diligence and we're already looking at how what they have been how, what they have been following throughout the time, so that we understand their performance uh, and if it's worth 
bringing in on the on them on the portfolio and if the delta to bring them to the standard that we want them to be is worth the investment so we are looking at that from the the capital uh, uh access perspective as well and i think I, I will summarize here i know my minutes are running quickly here but i will summarize here by saying that the overall uh yes it culminates with the idea of communicating performance, being authentic about uh, where you are and how you're performing, uh, but having accountability for that data, that information, holding that narrative of, of, your, of your company uh, and communicating that with your stakeholders in ways that are relevant to them. Um, and then so relevance and, and how you communicate which, K, which ESG factor, which KPI uh, is in, in helping them drive that prioritization, something that we work with our companies very closely. And with the increased availability of non-financial data coming up in the market and, and different algorithms being utilized to rank data uh, and rank companies, um, I think I would close by saying that we are, we are navigating towards a future where companies uh, will have to look at what is expected of them in the market and adjust uh, very fast um, in accordance to what is being expected of them and time that with the performance that they, they, they have in-house currently. And I think my time is over and I will uh, pass it over to Kathleen, but I'll be more than glad to ask questions in any of the stages that I just mentioned about any of the stages that I, that I just mentioned. Thanks, Kathleen. Good deal. Thank you, Kayla. There's there's so much to talk about on this subject. <laughs> um, I think we'll be up against the time mark. Um, and I just like to remind everyone: you can send your questions to Jen in chat, and then she'll she'll pass them over to us. Um, uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to Marianne so she can give us uh, her perspectives. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you NACD Tri Cities Chapter for this opportunity. And I appreciate uh, Steve and Kayla both with kind of setting up a stage um, in talking about this most important topic, I think. But uh, I, I'm gonna come at it from a little different perspective for a minute and talk a bit about the investor. Uh, I was an institutional investor for many years, I'm still working with institutional investors. And, and you know, this is what we talk about access to capital because that's where that capital is coming from. And so, the dialogue now, and with, uh, investors are becoming a lot more um, sophisticated. And as Steve showed uh, through one of his slides, they're becoming more active, either in the it was a public company or with a private company. So it's, and as a result, uh, when investors invest in a company or they invest, let's say, in a uh, private equity fund, for example, they're going to look at how they make those investments into companies, sort of like what uh, Kayla's been talking about. They're going to ask those questions in their due diligence. They're going to want to know who is making those decisions, how those decisions are made. And then once the decision is made, what are you doing about that? Are you making sure there's not any what we call greenwashing occurring? Meaning uh, we have a nice policy. We'll show you the policy. It looks great on a piece of paper. We even uh, put a little frame around it and put it up on the wall. But then when it comes right down to it, we kind of forget a little bit about it, you know? And so this is where um, I think we have to look at all the stakeholders. We look at our shareholders, of course, but we have to look at all the stakeholders because some of those shareholders are also stakeholders, meaning they might be also folks that are in your supply chain. Um, and so they're gonna ask those questions and you're gonna need to have those answers. Um, and I think one of the most important things, and we talk about in, in, in this uh, particular topic and talking in the energy sector, which fits right in the E, the environmental piece of it. But I do think that the G is almost uh, as important, if not more important, because the G, the governance, the board of directors we're talking about, the management um, is where it lies. And it's where also decisions are made. And it's what those decisions are based on. And it's, and it's how those decisions are made. And I think, you know, those things are important to any board. Those things are important to management. 
But I think what's different now is that these investors are going to look at more, they're going to try to look and peel that onion and look how you really are making those decisions. Who is in that boardroom? And what do they look like? Or, or do you have a diverse board, for example? Um, and are you working, you know, with the community, or at least are you a steward of the community as much as you can be? And depending on what kind of company you are, you know, you may be a software company that doesn't have, you know, a lot of connection to the community in the same way uh, as maybe an energy company. This, it, it, so it's going to be different. But the but what you are doing is you're you're having the discussion. It's part of your um, your culture. It's part of your fabric. And I think once investors see that and see that you are talking about it and you're discussing it and you're making decisions by taking that in consideration, then I think what I said the other day in Texas, it, that goes a fur piece, you know, and. They, the decisions may not everybody may agree with those those decisions, but at least you had a process, mm -hmm. and you had a process where you brought folks together to make those decisions that were appropriate for your company. But um, so it, it, what I see is that these investors are are demanding this, and because we are, we are on our smart devices right now or computers, they have access to data. And they pull it from everywhere. May not be the best data, may not be that accurate, but they they're pulling it in. And so, as a result, you know, uh, I know that you know if we start feeling bad or something, what do we do? We Google. Okay, I have a stomach ache. What does that really mean? And so we all do that. And so our investors are doing that. And so, and they're doing it in a way that they're, they're grabbing some data that may not all add up. And that's what makes it more important, I think, today for the boards and management to have their narrative and, and be able to then communicate uh, with the investors and also be able to implement some of these things that they are asking for. And then you're not gonna do everything they're asking for, of course, but I think if, if you are making, having these discussions, I think that will, will bode you well in, in the growth and the sustainability of your company. You can call it something else as opposed to sustainability. There is a group from Harvard and they've teamed up with some folks in Oxford and they call it, I'm working with boards, you know, enacting purpose with your initiatives. Um, and they have come up with, Instead of just focusing on sustainable, because that has become a buzzword, if you will, but they're talking about boards are being, should be, um, they, in order to be, um, to take these things into consideration, they should act on purpose. Uh, they should have connection. They should simplify their um, message. And I think that those are all important things to, to take home and, to think about when you're in that boardroom or you're, you know, uh, in management at that meeting. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd like to talk about and talk briefly yesterday. I mean, we are sitting most of us here in Texas, and and I'll give you an example of you know Texas's version of ESG. So Texas, as you probably are aware, most recently just um, a bill which was passed, signed into law by the governor and became effective 9-1 um, of 21, just became effective. And that is that, that Texas is having its war, as, it, as um, the author of the bill calls it, on the anti-energy industry with Wall Street. And that was Representative John King, but he was the author of the bill. And that is you cannot, since Texas's economy is based on oil and gas, you cannot uh, boycott um, the oil and gas industry, or you cannot, or those who divest themselves of fossil fuels. It's going to be interesting to see how that's going to be implemented and what the effect that's going to be. But that's Texas's answer to this issue of sustainability in um, the environmental sector or in, in energy. Um, and then you can contrast that with California. Uh, Calsters has teamed up with BlackRock, big surprise, 
Uh, they actually have some other kind of management uh, agreements between them, but I digress on that. But they have teamed up with Black, BlackRock on their low carbon uh, agenda. And, and so you've got, you know, uh, on the one hand, you've got, you know, California's response, and then you've got Texas on the other. I noticed on the government slide, uh, Steve, you didn't have Texas as the Republic of Texas all with by itself in the United States when that was all blue. Um, and, and I say that just, just, you know, in all candor is that these are, you know, each is trying to, to um, protect its economy. Uh, and they have, they have decided that this is what their policy should be in order to protect their economy and the businesses within the, the respective state. So it makes it, I understand it, but in the long run, putting a stake in it on, on either side, you know, um, may not be the way to go. Um, and what a lot of other folks are doing is kind of more uh, in the middle, you know, in their uh, response to this. And, you know, um, even uh, Steve, when you were talking about um, uh, your title has transition in it, the energy transition. And so transition is not um, like taking the Titanic and trying to move it around on a dime. Can't do that. Transition is, as the, the name implies, you have you ha to, to actually become and change, it takes a period of time. You can't, and, and, and I, you know, probably we will never, at least not in our lifetimes or our children or grandchildren's lifetimes, not have any reliance on uh, oil and gas, uh, fossil fuels, but uh, that doesn't mean that we can't have it be more balanced and have it to be more, as I will use the word, the buzzword, sustainable. But but the trend, how we do that trend, again, I'm going to go back to how we do that transition and the governance piece of it. The investors are going to look at that and they're going to ask questions about it. Uh, I know this because I've seen it in their due diligence, in their um, checklists, in the questions they ask, in their consultants they uh, rely on to get information about a company or a business. Um, in the statement right now, I'm working with a board who is an issuer. They're going to issue uh, some bonds. And they're, what they are concerned about is what some of these investors are going to want in the disclosure statement about that, about their business, and about what they're going to use this money for, and what kind of process do they have. And so I'm going to be meeting with this, this board in um, next month. We're going to talk about what do you say about ESG or how do I approach this and how does that fit in with my company? Um, and so I think uh, these are all good questions. And the fact that you're all here uh, today means that the, you realize that they are good questions and they're ones that we just needed to, to talk about. Um, and so uh, I think at that point, I will just leave it for any questions later on and um, for the whole group. Thank you. Hey, yeah, thank you, Marianne. And uh, once again, unplanned, perfect tee up uh, for the first question. And before I ask that, and this is going to go to uh, all three panelists, I'll ask Steve to weigh in first, um, and then uh, Marianne, and then Kayla. Um, and I'd like to mention, uh, we will share with all of the attendees a reference to the rulemaking that Marianne uh, just mentioned, along with Steve's slides. So here's our first question. All of us know the energy transition is real, but there's a disagreement as to the timing of the transition, which we talked about in the planning call yesterday. Uh, previous transitions, biomass to coal, coal to oil took place over decades. What is your view on the timing of the current transition and its impact on oil and gas, our producers, midstream oil field services companies and refiners? And if you can weigh in on access to capital, as you comment on that. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, and, and great question. Uh, and, and I do believe this is truly a transition. Uh, this is about companies addressing what they, they are going to do to truly transition, reduce their carbon emissions 
reduce their carbon footprint, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. This is not expected to happen overnight. But what is expected to be happening immediately is development of the plans to achieve that by 2050 and a glide path by 2030. I sit within city and I sit on a uh, sustainability board within city. We, we, as I shown in a previous slide, this is one of the large emitting sectors, energy, as there are others, transportation and, and other cement and other sectors. We go through this on a biweekly basis, looking at all of our clients and looking at where they are from the carbon emissions, where they are from a net uh, from a commitment and what are they doing and stating as to what their process is and what their goals are. And we will continue to monitor that. We're visiting with our clients. We're not getting out of any of the energy business that uh, as a result of carbon emissions today. But we are, what we do want to do is work with our clients to get there. And uh, if there is not a commitment by clients to do something and we're not seeing that happen over time, then we will be exiting those and as, as will every other bank and insurance companies and investors, et cetera. So you've got time. Uh, what the market really wants to see, and I say the market being investors and banks, uh, is, a, is a plan, is a commitment, is a, a stated goals and how you expect to get there. It's very hard. We're committed to net zero by 2050 and, and we're developing a glide path to 2030. And I'll sit here today in front of every one of you and say, we don't know how we're going to do it. We're developing those plans now. We're, we're identifying the measurement metrics, um, but we are committing to scope one, two, and three. And three means our clients. Three means our, our you all, uh, which means for us to get to net zero 2050 on a scope three, all of our clients have to be there. So that's going to be critically important. And those that don't get there will lose access to capital and we'll have to find it from other sources, which will be much more expensive. Thank you, Steve. Um, I forgot who I asked to go next. Marianne, would you mind giving us a couple thoughts on this topic? <laughs> sure, so I was supposed to one go next. Um, you, know, you had talked about uh, in part, part of that question was the access to capital. Mm -hmm. And um, again, talking about the investors, um, and so that I, I do think that the, the trend um, with um, a large segment of investors is that a, as of a certain time frame, there will not be access to capital for, unless you are involved or in part of, or on the way to your sustainable um, program uh, in reducing, you know, your, your carbon footprint. And so I, that, uh, some investors um, are looking at, you know, 2030, which um, it's hard to believe it's almost, it's near the end of 2021. So that is, that main, <laughs> that's pretty aggressive. Um, but when you talk about 2050, that seems like um, that, that is, uh, is much more doable and not only doable, but more appropriate, I think, because it, you do need to have a transition. I think the key is, is to have that strategic plan in place. Um, you got to start somewhere. You know, as we all know, when we've done business plans or strategic plans, they can be changed and amended, but you got to start with it. Um, and you've got to have a discussion um, and start with the, the plan. Thank you, Marianne. Um, Kayla, do you have anything to add to that? Because you definitely see it from a, a, another perspective of how doable is it? Sure. Kathleen, I think the, 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 audit, the person who asked that question is correct that this is a very different transition, right, from the previous transitions we had in the past that came through the availability of a, a different technology or a different fuel source that then drove the demand in a different way. Instead, this transition is being driven by a scientific pressure on the timing and the urgency of, of global climate uh, patterns. And so we are trying to fit in everything we do in terms of technology and, and, and how we power the world through that timeline. So as Steve mentioned, there is there's a lot of understanding on that timeline given 
what we're already seeing in terms of the results of, of, of global warming uh, as the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports just released about a month and a half ago showed uh, there is what they're calling undeniable um, evidence that we need to take action now. And so hence this urgency and the agreed upon timeline of 2050 with action plans to 2030 so that you can then the actions to done throughout the time can catch up to 2050. And it is a transition like no other because we don't have the technology, we don't have the ways to get there yet. So we are, we are trying to achieve something while we're trying to develop the the solutions for it, right? So it's very unique. And uh, when you look at what the IEA uh, projects in terms of how much capital it will take to power or to, to fuel financially fuel this, this transition, it's enormous. I, I don't remember the number uh, from the top of my head right now, but it's it's a well over the trillion numbers. And and I think that is the, the exciting part of the transition, which is the generation of opportunities, right? In technologies such as, well, first of all, I'll put the parentheses with the acknowledgement that, that we will need hydrocarbons for a long time, but we'll need cleaner hydrocarbons, right? You, you have to decarbonize that production um, and we'll need everything else in terms of cleaner, renewable, uh, energy and technology as well. And a major piece of that technology that is acknowledged by the market right now and the technology already exists that we are, Quantum is already piloting and, and, and thinking about as a major investment is carbon capture utilization and storage as a solution for bridging the gap between the world that is still run by hydrocarbons and where a world where ideally everything will be renewable, which is very, very far down the road. Uh, we do understand that there's a need to do both simultaneously, but it all boils down to having a plan to being able to demonstrate that you acknowledge that path and that you have a, a roadmap in place to address it. It's starting by decarbonizing your operations, by understanding what are the KPIs you have to put in place, investing on them, and then making change over time. Um, 2030 is around the corner, but it also means that you, you, you still have to, that decade to work on that decarbonization piece, which if you haven't started yet, it means that you still have a lot of low hanging fruits in terms of productivity to gain. Um, so that's a, it's an exciting part as well. And if you have been on this journey for a long time and you have tapped out in terms of productivity and opportunities to decarbonize that bring some kind of return, even if it's smaller, then you're reaching a point where you're looking at the transition in technology and that for the investment side is very exciting as well. And I will stop here and see if there is any follow up question. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, appreciate, uh, you know, these, uh, your, all the insights on this. And it is a, a question that, you know, every company that's represented um, in this, in this room is, is grappling with. I'm going to ask you a follow up uh, kind of in the, in the same realm from the audience. Um, given the importance of data quality, you know, as we're thinking about planning our transition and then measuring it, we'll have our internal metrics, there will be lots of external metrics um, and the important, you've touched on uh, data quality. And so given the importance of data quality in, in the ESG realm, uh, what, what is your advice? What is the best way for companies to manage the many ESG raters? They use different sources of data. We'll have our own opinions. How do we, how do we navigate that? Kathleen, I can, I can take a, a first stab at that question. So um, let's think about it from the perspective of, you know, uh, crawl, walk, and run. <laughs> so I would say start with your raw data. Um, the quality of the data that you're generating on site is really as good as the, the in, intention you have to measure, monitor that data. So start with measuring and monitoring, setting KPIs, knowing where you are, where your performance is. And if you already know that very well and you have that knowledge, 
if you're a public company and you are you are publishing those re those results through either your 10k filing or your sustainability report or any other investor communication make sure that that data is somewhat uh, you can stand by that data. And if it's a data that is officially reported to an agency, for example, state or federal, I would say make sure that that data can be verified later on. Uh, obviously, you, wanna, you want that to be verifiable because if the agency comes back, you want to make sure that you can prove that. But um, more often, investors are asking for that verification as well. And then dealing... Okay, so all of that then generates the information that raters use. Raters use publicly available data, and more and more now they're using artificial intelligence, AI technology to scrub the universe of what exists in the internet. And, and then they're partnering with data providers, raw data providers, such as or, uh, companies that are capturing data through satellite imagery, uh, through uh, on-site gathering data, measuring, uh, despite your knowledge, right? Despite your permission, it's happening. Um, and then the rating agencies are gathering all of that. And it's massive, massive amounts of data. And they're using AI to, to be able to, to filter all of that because it's really humanly possible, impossible to, to understand the, the, the brass of all of that. And then they're rating your company. And the, the, the advice that I give to companies who are having a, a war with raiders is engage with them. It's, a, it's not a secret, but it's somewhat of a kind of undertone knowledge that rating agencies will speak with you. Some of them will refuse to speak with you, but they will have a period of, of opening consultation where they will say your report is open for revision. So have someone go into that agency and review what is publicly available and correct it if it's not correct. Uh, because the quality of the data that's going to be in there is depend on the quality of the data that you have publicly available, be it through state federal agencies or your sustainability report, your 10K filings, et cetera. And if it's not right, engage with them on correcting it. The second secret is a lot of the ESG rating uh, companies, they, they have paid services. And guess what? If you pay to engage with them for some other purpose, such as, for example, if you're taking a sustainability linked loan uh, and you need to prove your baseline and you need to prove verification, and uh, one of the requirements of a sustainability linked loan is that you have that, you can work with one of these uh, agencies and use their rating as the baseline for the conversation, the agreement for your sustainability linked loan. It could be one of the KPIs that you use. I personally had done that through Crown Holdings, a company I used to work with before, um, when we took a $3.2 billion um, uh, revolver uh, sustainability linked loan, our sustainability uh, the, the, the indicator we used was sustainalytics. At the time, our sustainalytics points were X. And then by the time we were assessed, we had doubled that, which means we got a discount of at least five points on that, uh, on that loan. So okay. it can be advantageous for you as well in that sense. So the, thank you. Thank you, Kayla. These are uh, great, uh, great insight into how we ought to think about that. And then the questions we should be asking. Um, at the board level is we're checking uh, the process and, and uh, back to Marianne's point about governance and oversight of ESG. So we have five minutes left. I, uh, and I'd like to have time for each panelist to leave us with um, their one takeaway that we should have uh, from, this, from this program. And um, before we do that, Marianne, I sent you a question in the chat. If you can give us a 30 second answer on, are there any metrics out there around how much we should be spending on our ESG programs versus you know, measured by a percentage of revenue or assets, anything like that? Are there any rules of thumb out there? I'll unmute myself first. Um, I, um, I don't think there's any real metrics if you have, if you're, $5 billion company, then you have to have, you know, a hundred thousand spent on this or whatever. Mm -hmm. But 
that being said, if you are a $5 billion company, you better have a good program and you better have some employees that are committed to it. Um, You better have some resources that are committed to it. Um, If you, I, you know, I was working with a very small company. Um, They don't have very many employees. They invest in directly into companies and they also do secondary investments. I worked with them on how they can uh, implement ESG principles into their investment process, into their selection of their investments. And when they work with their companies, some of them, they take a, a minority stake. So how do you, how do, you do that? Mm-hmm. Uh, worked with, I actually drafted an investment policy statement for them. So those are, but, but dedicating X amount of dollars, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be applied to them really wouldn't be appropriate for that business. Yeah. You just need but, to have, you be, need to be able to show this is a high priority. That's, that's right. And, okay. and that's right. And, um, and you. you've got to have someone dedicated to it, mm-hmm. either a person or a committee, or it's got to be some dedication of resource. You don't have to have the sustainability office and put a placard and all that. Yeah. Okay. Necessarily. You know, Thank I mean, you. yeah. Let's, let's, Keela, what's your takeaway then? Sure. Kathleen, I think the takeaway that I share with everyone is um, utilize ESG to your advantage. Um, Use ESG for value creation. Know what is that your company contributes to the world in terms of the energy transition, the circular economy, and all those five pillars that Steve showed at the beginning. And then look at how you can include yourself in the marketplace as a leader in that. So um, ESG is, is, is seen as uh, implementation of social environmental social governance uh, factors throughout the three pillars of your company, right? Profit, people, and product. Uh, there's no way of shying away from it, uh, being angry about it and then, and, and, making a blind eye towards it, it won't work. So use it to your advantage, use it for uh, getting excited about what, how you can get your company and use that as a strategic movement. And that's All right. my takeaway. Thank you. Um, yes, so that's excellent advice. Steve, do you have um, some advice uh, for our audience? Yeah, briefly, I would say, uh, look, ESG is an evolution. Uh, it is transition, but it is a revolution. Uh, it is critically important to to your stakeholders, to your to your banks, to your investors. Therefore, it has to be critically important to you as a board member and to the company. If you're not actively involved in discussion, if it is not one of the highest priorities going on within the company, make it one, because increasingly uh, you will be under scrutiny, and it's better to be ahead of it than behind it. And so I'll leave it there, but it's, it's, it's critical and it's growing in importance. Fantastic. Thank you. Great panel. Energy transition is a revolution. It's not an evolution. Make it a top priority and use it to your advantage. Those are great takeaways. 